Hello my beautiful blossoms and welcome to today's video. I'm so glad you're here and you've made it. Today we're going to do part two of the two-part series talking about Maria Primachenko, a beautiful Ukrainian artist. I love her so much. I just wanted to say this video is sponsored by me. I am the CEO of a company called Mila and Such where we make beautiful silk scarves and other accessories created from my paintings and my illustrations. Right now I am releasing a new collection called Fairy Tales that features artwork from my favorite fairy tales from the 1970s when I grew up back in USSR. It's actually really cute. I really love it. I hope you love it as well. Um, I hope it brings you back to the days of when we were still little children. Uh, there is the Little Mermaid and there is a less popular story. They're both stories that were based on Hans Andersen's fairy tales, who is one of my favorite authors. I still love him. And I hope you enjoy this video. Ow! Pie! Hi. I have no idea why I do that. I just don't know how else to begin. This seems appropriate. So how are you guys? Uh, this is part two to the Maria Primachenko's uh, biography. And um, the more I read about her and the more I look at her artwork, the more excited I get. It's just so, so cool. We stopped when she got married and had her son but i do want to rewind a little bit because last time i just i forgot to mention when she was invited to kiev to do her uh, studies at the kiev museum she was also invited to exhibit in a lot of different uh, places overseas and she ended up winning a gold medal she was really just well received by the art community her work was so you know out of this world which Literally, her work was really cool and out of this world. No one's really seen anything like that. It was folk art, which was Ukrainian folk art. And 1941, she ended up going back home. During that time, she really wanted to expand and share her vision and just her happy outlook on, on art. So she ended up opening a school to teach kids art. Uh, in her village of um, Bolotnaya. First, she taught her son, his name is Fyodor. He was her main student. She taught him uh, to kind of continue in her footsteps. Her style was just so unusual for back then. And even now, she made these creatures that were poured out of her imagination. Uh, it was said that she actually had beautiful eye for composition and for color, which to this day, people bring her work up as example. She established that school that I was talking about. It was in the 1960s. So in the 1960s is when she really decided to share her art and to share her technique and her vision with others. Pablo Picasso, which I think most of us are probably familiar with, as well as Marc Chagall, he saw her work, he acknowledged her talent, and he loved her style. I thought that was pretty cool. In the 1970s and 1980s uh, to about 1980s when she was painting mostly on white backgrounds she had colors in her creatures her flowers her birds and all of those beautiful things but she did not really use color in her backgrounds i don't know why that would be but there's lots of reasons i suppose some of them could be because really dark times maybe she didn't really feel very colorful i mean she did but you know what i mean with art it's weird she started painting on the walls of the of the huts of the little houses that they lived in and most of those walls were actually painted white it's just covered up in makeup i'm gonna have to molly molly please stop chewing on yourself molly's always by my side okay i'll just do a little wipey wipe wipe 
and um, she established the school and in the, between 1970 and 1980 she switched her artistic style and she started having really beautiful colored backgrounds uh, that made her art, art pop even more. In 1986, now she lived about 12 miles from Chernobyl. Raise your hand if you remember what happened in Chernobyl. It was not fun. I was actually there when Chernobyl happened and so was she. I remember reading uh, an interview, was one of the very few, and I remember reading this one where she said that she was completely devastated. She was there, she saw the pain and she saw the devastation that happened during Chernobyl. In 1996, she actually created a Chernobyl series that she basically expressed her feeling about what happened. And I know they were displayed in Kiev uh, Art Museum. So when she did that, at that point her, her son, it was 1996, so at that point her son it was also a, a well-known artist, a well-known folk artist. And another fun fact I learned about her is that she was also a poet. Um, apparently she wrote really uh, beautiful poetry. I could not find any myself. She did that and again, you know, her son was her biggest fan. They, they lived together um, in the same village uh, until the day she died. I'm not sure if they lived like together together, but it wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised. So she reached uh, worldwide recognition. She had exhibitions in Paris, all over Europe. From what I have read, I, I don't exactly remember what countries, but uh, it was pretty much all over Europe. And she died in 1997 in the same town, in the same little village that she was born in surrounded by her family. She has two grandsons who are also artists, Ivan and Peter. Nobody really knows how many works of art she ended up creating, at least a thousand. And that's not counting all the work that she actually gave away to friends and family. And she, I, I think I mentioned it in my first part of this video, but she never charged anybody for, for her work. So this awesome lady left this amazing legacy. In 2006, her son, Fyodor, his house was robbed where he and his family were living. Like over 600 pieces of work, I think, were stolen. This was devastating to the family. They basically reported that each of the pieces that was taken was worth at least $10,000. It's a lot of dough. Uh, they said that some of those pieces were found just on like the black market because you know where else would they go that's so beautiful and they tried to find these pieces and take them back and i believe they were successful to some degree i think some of the pieces were retrieved but a lot of them went missing unfortunately the very cool thing that happened later on um is that in 2009 just trying to blend that out so I don't look like Matryoshka. In 2009, a street in Kia was named uh, Primashenko Boulevard. That is where some of her work was displayed. And also, there were movies made about her, about her life, about how she inspired other artists and how she basically, you know, brought Ukraine and its folk art. In 2017, there was a whole project where on Primashenko Boulevard they created these beautiful installations of her art and I'm talking about they were large they were big they were really really cool they were pretty they were very very much just like her art her work can still be seen there's uh, hundreds of pieces that were donated and sold I'm kind of loving my eyes too Hope you can see them. It's like a little purple. You gel platey. So I've been using these uh, Juvia's plates. Just kind of been obsessing over them a little bit. Well, when talking about a, a colorful, beautiful, magical artist. 
And I always put my glitter on with my finger, it just sticks so much better. Um, so of course we have to add a little bit of sparkle because I feel like Maria Primachenko has added a little bit of sparkle to the art world with her magic. I mean, these were like equivalent of Ukrainian unicorns, you know? Beautiful, beautiful pieces of work during really hard times. I mean, I was summarizing this before and I was like, Russian Revolution, World War I, World War II, Chernobyl. She was there when USSR was no longer an S and an R. It was just, you know, it was just Russia. So she lived through so much and she still continued to create these beautiful, happy pieces. That's another thing that I wanted to uh, end this video with, really. You don't have to be a suffering artist to create unique, beautiful pieces. You just have to feel deep. To end this video, I hope you guys liked listening and learning a little bit about this incredible artist, Maria Primachenko. Um, I hope you check out some of her work. I'll link some of the pictures of her artwork below. So all we have to do is I just have to apply a little bit of a lip stick. What kind of a lip stick do I want? No, I'll make it this one. This kind of goes with my purple look. There is no lip liner needed because I can't talk and put lip liner on. So we're just gonna, you know, whoopsie wing it like that so again thank you so much for visiting my channel thank you for sitting through the first video and hopefully you'll be sitting through the next video i am going to be putting out a video talking about how to apply and remove matte lipsticks next like subscribe do all of those things and for my fellow artists creatives makers um i just want to say don't give up Work hard, surround yourself with people who love you and encourage you. Take example from somebody like this incredible artist who has worked and was true to herself through some of the most difficult times in our world history. So you can do it and I'll see you in my next video.